Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Core. Today I have yet another review video. And it feels like I've been doing a new one of these every few days, and it's because I got a huge stack of them. I think all of the companies are trying to push out as many devices as they can before Christmas. But my expectation here is that this is going to be the last major handheld release of this year. And so today we're gonna to be taking a look at the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus. Now you probably are familiar with this already because we did a review on the Retroid Pocket 3 not so long ago. And essentially this is just a major chipset upgrade for a shell that we're already familiar with. And so I'm hoping that in this video I won't have to dive into some of those details that I already covered in the Retroid Pocket 3 review. Because with the exception of one little thing, everything seems to be the same. And so instead in this video we're going to focus on the gameplay performance that you can expect with the new chipset on this device. Everything else that I loved about the original Retroid Pocket 3, the shape and size of it, as well as the screen quality, it's all right here as well. But with the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus they finally put a chip in in there that is worthy of the really nice shell that they already had. And so I'm very excited about this one and even after just a couple days with it I'm already sure it's one of my favorites of the year. But of course it does have some cons which we'll get into later in the video. Now in addition to the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus there have been other devices that have come out in the past couple weeks with this exact same chipset. In particular, Ambernic released one at the exact same price. And so we're going to touch a little bit about that here in this video, but I am going to do my next video, which is going to be an actual comparison directly between the Ambernic RG505 and the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus that we have here. And so in this video, we're really just going to focus on what this device can do and what you're going to get for that price. And so without any further delay, let's just jump right into it. Okay, let's start with a quick disclaimer. I ordered all of my Retroid Pocket 3 Pluses myself. However, afterwards I did reach out to the company and asked if they could send them out early. And so I got about a week's head start when it came to testing compared to just your typical orders. Now let's talk a little bit about specs. To start, most of the internal hardware has been upgraded. The CPU is now a Unisoc Tiger T618, which is an eight core CPU. Additionally, they've upgraded the RAM to four gigabytes, and they've also increased it to 128 gigs of internal storage. This is really handy because you can add a lot of Android games to the device without having to worry about storage options with the SD card. Now this features the same screen as the previous Retroid Pocket 3 model. This is an IPS LCD panel with a touchscreen interface. It features a resolution of 1334 by 750 and a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. The going rumor about this screen is that it comes from an iPhone 6 and that makes sense because it's a really high quality panel. The Retroid Pocket 3 Plus has a 500 milliamp hour upgrade to 4500 altogether. And I found after about a week of heavy testing, I get between six and seven hours of gameplay on every charge. And it also takes about an hour and a half to charge it from zero to 100. In terms of other features, it has a five gigahertz Wi-Fi connection as well as Bluetooth 5.0. It also has a micro HDMI port for video out. Now the starting price for the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus is $150 before shipping. And I've seen the shipping cost be anywhere from $10 to $30 depending on where you live. They've also added a couple new color options from the previous model to a total of eight altogether. Now it's only been a few months since the Retroid Pocket 3 itself actually launched. And quite a few Retroid Pocket 3 owners were a little bit annoyed by the fact that their device that is new in their hands is now outdated. And that's an unfortunate component of this community as well as just the overall Chinese handheld industry. For example, over the past month, Ambernic has released two devices over the span of two weeks. And so I can totally get it how new Retroid Pocket 3 owners are feeling a little bit left out. Now one thing that Retroid does that I do have to applaud is that they offer upgrade PCBs if you want to convert your device from a Retroid Pocket 3 to a 3 Plus. And the pricing for the upgrade PCB is about half the price of a new 3 Plus model, so you do save quite a bit of money. This is the exact same thing that happened when they rolled out the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus from the Retroid Pocket 2. And I personally ordered one of these upgrade kits as well, so I'll be doing a video about how to go through that process too. However, just bear in mind that the Retroid company itself says that this upgrade is not for the faint of heart. And so unless you already consider yourself to be pretty handy with small tools, this may not be an upgrade that's of interest to you. Another thing worth mentioning is that there is a DIY section on the Retroid website as well. And here you can order new plastic shells in case you want to swap out the color. And the shell itself actually comes with the screen already installed, which is pretty handy. Additionally, you can order new buttons and analog sticks as well. Okay, enough about all that. Let's get into the device itself. 
To start, if you order the device in November, you're going to get a free tempered glass screen protector as you see here. And as you've probably guessed, I ordered the transparent blue model here. And I think it looks great. In addition, the first thing I noticed here is that the texture of this plastic on the transparent models is a little bit grittier than the other ones. Me, I'm a big fan of having textured plastic on my handhelds, so I'm a big fan of that. But yeah, other than that, it looks exactly like the old Retroid Pocket 3s. Starting with these models, they put the D-pad above the analog sticks, as you see here, and so it's more of a PlayStation-style analog layout. One of my favorite things about the Retroid line of devices is that they have stacked shoulders and trigger buttons. And these are micro-switch connections, but have a rubber covering on them, which gives them a soft clickiness. It feels a lot like the Joy-Cons on a Nintendo Switch, but a little bit firmer. My only complaint here is that the triggers are digital and not analog input. Let's take a look up top. So we have a power button here on the left, as well as a micro HDMI video out port. And then on the right, paradoxically, we still have those start and select buttons. It's just a really odd place to put them. Next, let's talk a little bit about the D-pad. Now this is exactly like how it was on the Retroid Pocket 3, which means it is a dome style switch, but also has a thin rubber membrane connection, which gives it a soft clickiness, much like how you would find on the PlayStation Vita. Now I know a lot of people prefer rubber membrane D-pads, and I usually do as well, but this one in particular, I really like. And the reason why I like it so much is because it's a very precise D-pad. Here I am playing Celeste on the Nintendo Switch emulator, and as you can see, it's playing fine. This is a very precision-based game, which means the difference between a diagonal and a cardinal input is the difference between life and death. And as you can see here, it's playing just fine. In fact, this is one of my favorite ways to play Celeste right now. And so overall, I would say this is one of the best D-pads in the business. It's very similar to the one on the AYN Odin, and like I mentioned, the PS Vita. Additionally, these are the same analog sticks that we found in the previous Retroid Pocket 3 as well. These are also very similar to the ones found in the AYN Odin devices, and they feel a lot like a Nintendo Switch analog stick, but the caps on them are a little bit smaller and thinner. Personally, I've always wished that these analog sticks were just a little bit larger. Now, one of the most recent releases from Ambernic actually featured hall sensor analog sticks that were also in the Switch style. And I really like the caps on these, and I've heard a rumor that these are a drop-in replacement for the Retroid Pocket 3. And so I'm going to test that out here really soon, and I'll make a separate video for that, so be on the lookout for that video. Now let's talk about the face buttons, because this is the one thing about the hardware that has changed. The Retroid Pocket 3 shipped with dome-style switches, much like with the D-pad, but for the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, they've gone back to a rubber membrane connection. This means it's going to feel more like an old-school button, like something you would find on a Super Nintendo gamepad. And typically, I really enjoy using rubber membrane connections with buttons, especially if they're done well. And I would say these rubber membrane connection buttons are pretty good. However, after just a few minutes of using it, I actually found myself wishing that I had the dome-style switch ones instead. It's not that the rubber membrane connections are bad, it's just that they feel a little bit mismatched from the soft clickiness of the D-pad itself. And so personally, if I had the option to choose, I would use the old dome style switches from the Retroid Pocket 3. These have a very nice soft clickiness to them and a little bit less travel and feel just as precise as the D-pad. Now the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus also went with rubber membrane connections for their A, B, and XY face buttons as well as their D-pad. And I think for this device it was fitting because both the D-pad and the face buttons were of the same kind of feel. And these buttons feel just about the same as they do on the 3 Plus. And so I wouldn't really categorize this as a complaint, more so as just that I think that it might have been a better fit with the dome style switches. Now thankfully I mentioned this to Retroid the other day, and they said that they are going to try and put those dome style switches up on their DIY section of their website. So if like me, you want to do a conversion down the line, that might be possible. Either way, I would give these buttons an 8 out of 10. There's absolutely nothing wrong with them, they just feel a little bit mismatched with the D-pad. And finally, taking a look at the bottom here, we have our SD card slot, which has a nice handy hard plastic covering right here. And then we also have our USB-C port for charging and peripherals, as well as a headphone jack. We also have dual stereo speakers here on the sides. You can see they're angled a little bit to the back. What that generally will mean is as I'm holding the device, the sound is going to bounce off of my fingers and then make its way up to my ears. I would definitely have preferred to have front firing speakers, but the audio quality here is not bad. Let's have a listen right here.
And so yeah, I think the audio quality here is great. I have seen reports of people with their 3 Pluses getting reverse polarity in their speakers, but in the two units that I tested, I did not have that issue. Okay, looking at the sides here, we have our volume up and down here on the left. And these also have a soft micro switch kind of feel to them. And you have to press down on them pretty hard to register. And so I've never accidentally adjusted the volume while playing. Same thing with the single home button here on the right side. Now, personally, I wish they had also had a back button here as well. I think the home button is just a little bit too limiting. And I also think that the button positioning is a little bit weird. For example, I would rather have the volume buttons appear with the start and select buttons and then move the start and select over to the far left. As it stands right now, usually I would use select plus a button combination for my hotkeys within emulators. But with this kind of setup, what I do instead is I use it with L3. So for example, within RetroArch, my hotkey in order to exit a game is going to be L3 plus R3. It takes a little bit of time to adjust to it because I'm used to using start and select. And so, all things considered, I do like the feel of the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus. I love the fact that all of the edges are nice and rounded, and I think it's the perfect size and shape for a mid-sized handheld. Part of that has to do with the fact that the device itself is relatively thin, a lot thinner than a lot of other handhelds on the market. And so, even though it does have stacked shoulder buttons that do stick out from the case quite a bit, it's still very pocketable. As you can see here, as I'm wearing shorts, it's just as easy to slide this in and out of my pocket as it would be a larger size cell phone. And so, like I mentioned in my Retroid Pocket 3 review, I do think this is pocketable. In fact, it's probably the largest device that is still pocketable that I own. Now, let's talk a little bit about ergonomics. It's not a perfect device when it comes to ergonomics, but it still feels very comfortable. A lot of that has to do with those stacked shoulder buttons. It allows you to rest your forefinger up here on top. Now, in a perfect world, I would have liked to have had a little bit of an ergonomic bump here around the grips. I think that would have made it even easier to hold. But as it stands, despite not being a very large device, I've never really felt like it's cramped. Now the other nice thing about these stacked trigger buttons is that it is quite comfortable to use with both the analog stick and the triggers at the same time. And this is an aspect that is only rarely found in a lot of these retro handhelds coming out at this price point. And this control setup really comes in handy with this specific device because the chipset on here is good enough to play some games that have dual analog controls. For example, I was able to manage pretty well with Time Splitters 2 on the GameCube. Now don't get me wrong here, it definitely feels like a compromised experience compared to something like an Xbox controller, but at the end of the day, I do think these controls are pretty good when it comes to playing dual analog stick shooters, or if you wanted to play more modern games via game streaming. And finally, let's take a look at the back of the device. As you can see here, there's no special ornamentation here or anything. And I appreciate that everything is very subdued on this device. The only logo here is on the bottom right of the screen. Speaking of which, let's tackle the screen next. Like I mentioned, this is a 4.7 inch display. And so it's not the largest display in the world, but I like the fact that it has fairly thin bezels and has very rich saturation when it comes to the colors. Just like with the Retroid Pocket 3, the saturation on this panel is very impressive to the point where it almost feels like an OLED display. And so let's do a quick comparison between this one here and the RG505, which has the PS Vita's OLED panel. Now, first thing you'll notice is that the colors are richer and a little bit cooler on the RG505. And that makes sense given the fact that this is OLED. But of course, the color saturation is only one piece of the puzzle. The other part here is going to be resolution. And the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus has about one third higher resolution than the RG505. What that means is that PSP games can be displayed at a 3x resolution on the RP3 Plus, but they're going to be limited to just a 2x resolution on the RG505. And so while I do find that both of these panels are impressive, it's really going to come down to personal preference. Now another comparison here would be with the Odin Lite. This one has a 6-inch display and a 1080p resolution. And thanks to the fact this has a beefier chipset, this one is capable of doing a 4x resolution with the PSP. And so that does give the Odin devices a little bit higher of a pixel density. But I would also say between the two that the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus has a little bit more saturation, which is something I really love. All things considered, I would say that the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus screen is one of the best out there, especially at this price point. And I think the resolution here of 750p is actually very fitting for the size of the screen that we have. And so I'm perfectly happy with this screen as it is. Now let's talk about these shell colors here for a moment. Because I'm using a green pad right here, I wanted to make sure that we had a more unadulterated image. And so here I am at the studio with a white background and natural lighting. And I haven't done any processing to the video image at all, so this is the kind of color that you can expect from the transparent blue. It has a little bit of a green tint to it, but not too much. 
Now, Retroid was also kind enough to send me a transparent purple shell to do a comparison here in this video. And again, this is what it looks like under normal lighting conditions. And as you can see, it is a very nice and vibrant purple. In fact, it's quite a bit more saturated than other transparent purple models like the AYN Odin Pro. In my Odin Pro review, I mentioned that I wish it was a little bit more purple, and I think the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus here nailed it. And so long story short, I'm actually very excited about these two different shell colors here. But these aren't the only Retroid Pocket 3 or 3 Pluses that I own, so let's go ahead and look at some of the others too. Here is my Retroid Pocket 3 16-bit color version that is modeled after the North American Super Nintendo. And this one has those older dome-style face buttons, which I'm thinking about swapping out with my 3 Pluses. And next we have my orange Retroid Pocket 3. Now personally, I think this one looks more yellow than orange, but I still really love the color regardless of the name. In fact, this one still remains my favorite color option available. Now, like I mentioned in the beginning, I also ordered one of those PCB upgrade kits, and this is what it looks like here. I'll save that for a future video. For now, I'm thinking about putting the kit inside this orange Retroid Pocket 3, and then putting those older internals into the transparent purple instead. Now finally, before I started wrapping up filming, I did get my other Retroid Pocket 3 plus order in the mail. And that is this one here. This is the European 16-bit version. And this one has a darker d-pad but also those rainbow colored face buttons. Another thing I didn't realize until I had them in hand is that there is a difference in the color of the shell between these two as well. The North American version has more of a gray colored shell compared to the European version which is more like a tan. Now let's talk very briefly about the setup process. When you first turn it on, it's going to walk you through this interface. And one of the options here is to enable Google Play services. Additionally, they have some free and open source apps that you can install ahead of time. And generally, I don't recommend using any of these apps because they can become outdated very quickly. However, there is one app that I do recommend, which is the Dolphin for handheld. And we'll talk about that one more when we get to the GameCube section. But yeah, I really do recommend this one. Everything else, honestly, I think you can just skip and get from the Play Store instead. Now, a couple months ago, I made a Retroid Pocket 3 starter guide. And in this guide, I walk you through how to set up your emulators and how to get them working with the Retroid front end. And honestly, the process between the 3 and the 3 Plus is exactly the same. And so I would say use the Retroid Pocket 3 starter guide and you'll have everything you need. There's a couple considerations with the 3 Plus because it has that more powerful chipset, and I'll make those updates in the written guide that accompanies the video. Now, since making that video, I've come to prefer a different front end than the one that Retroid provides. And this front end is called Daijisho, and I've made a dedicated video guide to this one as well. And so, long story short, I would recommend using the Retroid Pocket 3 starter guide to get up and running. But then also, when it comes to the front end, I would recommend checking out Daijisho as well. And that's the front end I'll be using here for the rest of the video. Before we get into emulation testing, let's talk a little bit about the overall software experience. Now, because this is an Android device, that means that boot up time is going to be relatively slow. As you can see here, it takes just under 34 seconds to do a cold boot. However, to be honest, I rarely actually turn the device off. Instead, I just put it into sleep mode. To do that, you can just press the power button to put it into standby and then tap it again to bring it back up. And I found that the standby battery drain is pretty good on this as well. Overnight, it loses about 2% of battery and over a 24 hour period, it loses about five. And to me, that is totally acceptable for a standby time. Anyway, here's a better look at the Daijisho front end. As you can see, I set it up so that I can tab between my systems, and then I can select my system, navigate through those games, and then launch my game from here. Now, each of the emulators will behave a little bit differently when it comes to closing out of a game. For example, with RetroArch, I use L3 and R3 to close out. But for others, you may have to set up an individual hotkey or maybe just press the home button on the right side of the device. Either way, after an hour or two of tweaking, I found that it is a very smooth and satisfying navigation experience. Okay, so now let's actually talk about performance testing and what you can expect from the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus. To start, we're not going to spend a lot of time on those more retro systems because these all are going to play just fine. One thing to consider is that 10x9 aspect ratio systems like Game Boy and Game Boy Color, as well as 4x3 content like you would find on the NES, Genesis, or Super Nintendo, they are going to have black bars on the sides considering that this is a 16x9 display. And so if you think that is something that might bother you, it is worth making note of that. However, when you start getting to some of the more wider systems, things like Game Boy Advance or PSP or some of the other emulators that have widescreen hacks, it becomes a lot less of an issue. As you can see here with Game Boy Advance, it looks great. In terms of arcade emulation, that increased performance does give you options to play some games that weren't playable on the Retroid Pocket 3. For example, Killer Instinct runs at a pretty good frame rate. It is not a constant 60 frames per second. It will dip down to something like 57 here or there. I also found that on certain levels when throwing a projectile, it will dip down to something like 53. So not a perfect experience when it comes to Killer Instinct, but man, it's pretty close. 
In terms of using the D-pad for fighting games, I think it's a very good fit. I found in particular I had no problems doing any sort of fireballs or dragon punches. And so when it comes to fighting games, I would say this device is definitely Shoryukenable. Moving on to some of the more harder to emulate systems, we're going to up the resolution as much as possible to really push the performance. And so for example with PS1, I'm going to use the Duck Station standalone emulator at a 4x resolution with geometry corrections on. And on average this is going to give you a resolution of 1280 by 864 So already that's a resolution that is beyond what's available to be displayed on the device, and as you can see it's still running fine. And so I would say for most games you can probably run it at a 4x resolution and it'll play great, and maybe a couple here and there you'll have to drop down to a 3x. Now when it comes to Sega Saturn, I prefer to use the original resolution, I just really like it when it's nice and chunky. However, I did want to show here that you can use a 2x resolution for every game with the Yabatsan Shiro standalone emulator and it's going to work great too. Now if you bump it up to a 3x resolution, you're probably not going to get this same smooth gameplay. And so if you want to play Sega Saturn, I would recommend either the native or a 2x resolution using the standalone emulator here. Moving over to Nintendo 64, this one I bumped up to a 1440x1080 resolution. Now this is a little bit of overkill considering the screen, but really I wanted to demonstrate that it can be pushed all the way this far. And so using the Mupin 64 Plus FC emulator, every game I tried at a 1080p resolution did just fine. And that includes even the heavy hitting games like Conker's Bad Fur Day and GoldenEye 007. And so if you're looking for upscaled Nintendo 64, this is going to be a very good solution. And it's the same thing with Sega Dreamcast as well. Here I'm using the Dreamcast emulator and I've used an in-app purchase to unlock the higher resolution. And so as you can see here I'm running everything at 1280 by 960 and everything is playing great. And even the harder games to emulate, things like Dead or Alive 2, Sega Rally 2, and NBA 2K2 are all running flawlessly at 60 frames per second at that higher resolution. Not only that, Redream has the option to go into the cheat section and enable widescreen for most of the games. And so these Dreamcast games play really well. In fact, it's almost like playing the remastered version of some of these games. Moving over to Nintendo DS, here I'm using the Drastic Emulator with the high resolution setting, which is a 2x resolution. And these games are playing absolutely fine, just like they did on the original Retroid Pocket 3. And thankfully, Drastic also has touchscreen support, and it works well on this device. So I would say it's not quite as good as having two screens on a device like the original Nintendo DS, but it's still pretty darn good. Keeping with the spirit of handhelds, let's move over to the Sony PSP next. And this is by far one of the stars of the show when it comes to the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus. On the original Retroid Pocket 3, you could get a 1x resolution on just about every single game out of the box. And if you did some fiddling with the settings, you could get a 2x resolution most of the time as well. But thankfully, the chip in the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus is so good you don't have to do any of that fiddling. In fact, I would say about 95% of all the games are going to play just fine at a 3x resolution, which is 1440 by 816 pixels. And much like with the Dreamcast, playing these games at that higher resolution on this device feels like you're playing a remastered version of those games. Now the really high tier games, things like God of War and Resistance and Killzone, those ones you will have to do at a 2x resolution instead of 3. But even then, I think a 2x resolution looks very good on this device. Now before we move over to the systems that start to struggle on the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, let's talk a little bit about performance. I've seen some speculation floating around that the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus has some sort of voodoo magic working that allows it to get better performance than the other systems with the same chipset. Well, if you look at the Geekbench scores, we're getting 380 for a single core score and 1156 for multi-core. If we compare that to the PAL Kitty X18S as well as the Ambernic RG505, you can see that the single core is about the same for all of them, but the multi-core is actually lower on the 3 Plus. And so in terms of just raw performance, I'm not really seeing it here in the numbers. However, when it comes to GameCube, the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus does have an advantage when it comes to that one emulator I mentioned before. Generally, what I like to do is use the Dolphin MMJR emulator because it has a good balance between accuracy and performance. The MMJR2 version has even better performance but at a cost of accuracy, which I typically don't really like. However, the Dolphin for handheld emulator that comes pre-installed on the device is actually a fork of Dolphin MMJR2. And I found that this one keeps the performance of MMJR2 but also has some upgraded accuracy as well. Additionally, this is the only emulator that is actually already outfitted for sub-native rendering. What that means is if there is a game you really want to play and it's not working well at a single native resolution, you can actually drop it to a 0.9 or a 0.8 or beyond to see if that gives you better performance too. Now generally I don't like going below native resolution because I think it just really muddies that image, but it is nice to see that if you do want to go that route, you have the option readily available within this fork. 
And so I ended up testing all three of these Dolphin variants as well as the vanilla version found in the Play Store. And when all was said and done, I found that the Dolphin for handheld one gave me that best mix of accuracy and performance. And so that's what we're going to use here in this video. And in addition to using that one emulator, I also recommend using the PAL version of these ROMs if possible. Many of these PAL ROMs capped out at 50 frames per second, which is going to be a lot easier to reach than 60 frames. And so that's going to give you a little bit of a leg up when it comes to performance as well. Now that being said, this emulator is not a miracle worker. We're still working with a limited CPU when it comes to GameCube. And so even when using the PAL version of Retroid Prime and dropping the resolution to 0.8, I was still not getting full speed when it comes to this game. And so it's really going to come down to your own individual tolerance and how much slowdown you can actually handle. But at the end of the day, I would say if you use the PAL version of the ROMs and the Dolphin for handheld emulator, you can expect at least 50% of games to play fine just out of the box. It's also going to really depend on the type of game as well. For the most part, when it comes to racing games, they don't really seem to do very well. For example, Need for Speed Most Wanted would play pretty good some of the time, but then also dip way down depending on what was happening on the screen. I also found that a lot of the first party platformers, things like Super Mario Sunshine and Wind Waker, actually would play just fine. Each of these would dip down just a little bit depending on the scene, but overall I would say these are definitely playable. In that same vein, I found that beat em ups and hack em slashes, things like Lord of the Rings or Beautiful Joe, these worked really well too. And so these games I also found to be perfectly playable. But in the end, I found the games that probably were the best fit for the system were role playing games. Many of these games played very well with minimal slowdown, and because many of these games don't rely on quick action sequences, it does make these slowdowns a little bit more forgivable. And so if you've been looking forward to having a handheld version of some of your favorite Nintendo GameCube role playing games, and you don't mind a little bit of slowdown here and there, this might be a really excellent fit for you. Okay, moving up, let's try Nintendo Wii next. Now, I didn't have high hopes for this since GameCube also struggled. And yeah, sure enough, I found that most of these games were too slow to play. Things like Mario Kart Wii or New Super Mario Bros. Wii, they were just way too slow. And it's a shame because these games look really good on this widescreen display. Unfortunately, same thing happened with the Mario Galaxy games. They're just a little bit too hard for this processor. And that makes sense because the AYN Odin devices, which are much more powerful than this one, also struggle with these same games. In fact, the only Wii game that I found to be playable, at least in my opinion, was Super Paper Mario. This one also had some slowdowns here and there, but much like with the GameCube role-playing games, I didn't really mind. Not only that, I was surprised to find that this Dolphin Fork actually did a very good job of having accurate gameplay as well. Many of the graphics in this beginning scene in particular are usually broken on most emulators, and the fact that it's running so well is actually really neat. Okay, let's move over to Sony PlayStation 2 next. Now when it comes to emulation performance with PlayStation 2, I found that the results here are very similar to GameCube, but maybe a little bit worse. And so with this system too, I recommend using PAL ROMs when they are available. And also when first setting up the emulator, I recommend using the fast preset. Now under the system settings, there's options for underclocking. And my recommendation for that is to set it to 100% or zero underclocking and test the game first to see how it plays. And I think you'll find in summary that maybe about 25% of PS2 games will play just fine with no underclocking enabled. It may still get some slowdown here and there, but in general I would say yeah, about 25% is about right. Now if you start testing more games and you find that some of them are actually a little bit slower than you would like, that's when you can go into the settings and start messing with the underclocking. And sometimes that will work out pretty well with games like Zone of the Enders or Star Wars Starfighter. These two games still have a little bit of slowdown even with underclocking, but it does improve the gameplay experience. Other games like the two God of War games will require you to put in an underclock just to make them playable. And these two games react pretty well to underclocking, but they will also have a bit of frame skipping too. And so the gameplay will not be as smooth as it could be, but if you just want to get through the game, this might be an option. And so long story short, for most of the games that I did try, I was able to use no underclocking and they worked out pretty good. But bear in mind that I was very selective about what games I tried, the ones I knew were going to emulate pretty easily, and I also attempted to use PAL ROMs as much as I could. And so in summary, when it comes to GameCube and PlayStation 2, I would not actually say this is a device that's capable of playing those systems. Because I think if you start talking in those kind of considerations, then you might get a little bit disappointed when your favorite game doesn't play. Instead, I like to think of these two systems as an additional bonus over what I was previously expecting. It's already amazing that a device for $150 can play PSP, Nintendo 64, and Dreamcast upscale. And so to me, GameCube and PS2 is just a little bit of icing on that cake. 
Another system that's going to give you a lot of hit and miss gameplay is going to be Nintendo 3DS. There will definitely be some games that are playable. For example, New Super Mario Bros. 2 at a native resolution will play just fine after you've been playing it for a while so that the shaders can cache. Other games like Ocarina of Time 3D will play at full speed, but has a bunch of graphical glitches just based on compatibility with this chipset. And so this is kind of a shame because this would be a great gameplay experience if we didn't have these compatibility issues. Other lightweight and 2D games like Rayman Origins and Metroid Samus Returns are pretty much playable. You'll have some slowdowns here and there, but overall I think you'll probably get through these games. And even though Mario Kart 7 is somewhat playable some of the time, I would say this is still not a game worth playing on this system. When it comes down to it, I think on a budget, the best way to play Nintendo 3DS games remains playing them on a regular 3DS. But it is nice to have a couple games here and there that are playable if you want to play them on the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus. And finally, the last emulated system I want to show off here is going to be Nintendo Switch using the Skyline emulator. Now, like I mentioned with the other device reviews that have the same chipset, the compatibility is not great on this emulator when it comes to this chip. And so nine times out of 10, most of the games are not going to play. But there are going to be quite a few that play at full speed, things like Sonic Mania or Celeste, as well as Kamiko. But once you start getting into the more demanding games, things like Bastion, it's just going to crash after a couple minutes. And then other games like Steam World Dig 2 are just going to be unplayably slow. And so you're really going to have to pick and choose what specific Switch games are going to be playable. Another one that is actually pretty good is this one here called Messenger. And while we're at it, I think it's a good time to take a cat break. For anyone that's new to the channel, this is my cat Chicken, and she likes to sit on my lap when I'm testing my games. Now we haven't done a lot of cat breaks lately because it's been pretty hot in Hawaii, but now that the weather is cooling down, she's been spending several hours with me every day. And so hopefully you can expect to see more cat breaks here in the future. Anyway, back to the Nintendo Switch, all I really want to say here is that most games aren't going to play, but some will. And I'd also be on the lookout for some compatibility spreadsheets from the community to see which games specifically are going to play best with this device. Okay, so that's it for emulation, now let's actually talk about Android gaming and streaming. To start with Android games, let's talk about touchscreen mapping. If you swipe over from the right, you'll have an option to bring up a key mapper. And within here, you can assign buttons to whatever thing you want to tap on the screen itself. And so this can effectively give you the option to map your touchscreens to the buttons so you don't have to touch the screen. One point here is that if you're going to use the right analog stick to move your camera around, make sure that you tap on the right joystick and then select adjust view mode. And then also for most games, you want to adjust this sensitivity way down, something between 20 and 30 percent. And luckily after you save it, it's going to save that profile for that specific game. And so anytime you start up a game like Call of Duty Mobile, it's going to remember your button mapping for the future. Now one unfortunate thing here is there's no ability within the key mapper to invert your y-axis controls. And so for someone like me who has to play everything with an inverted y-axis with first-person shooters, this is still kind of unplayable. Now the Odin was able to implement this with a firmware update, and so I'm hoping that we'll see something like this with Retroid 2 because that would be really handy. Another game that works really well with a key mapper is Genshin Impact. For this one I did the exact same setup where I have my left analog stick controlling my movement and then the right analog stick doing the camera control. From there I set up all of the button mappings to mimic something like Breath of the Wild and yeah, it works great. Now this is a pretty hefty game and so in order to get it to run relatively smoothly I had to set it to the lowest settings and 30 frames per second. But if you want to play this game portably with Android, the key mapping works pretty well. And for all the other games that I tested that had native gamepad support, these all worked really well. And all I did to find all these games was just to Google the words Android games with gamepad support. And so there are quite a mix of games that have that native support. And one other note here is that there are some gyroscopic control sensors within the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus as well. And so if you're playing a game that has tilt support and gamepad access like Real Racing 3, this might be a lot of fun. Okay, and finally let's talk about game streaming. And so here I'm starting up the Xbox app and then doing a local connection here to my Xbox in the house. And so here I am doing remote play with Destiny 2 and yeah, it's working really well. I also tried out cloud streaming with Game Pass and that one worked too. In fact, no problems with the L2 and R2 buttons, which is typical of many handhelds. Same thing with doing remote play with the PS5 via the app called PS Play. This one's super easy to set up and I'm streaming it here at 1080p and it looks and plays really well. Additionally, I did some local game streaming for my PC using the app called Moonlight. And with this app, I was able to access my Steam catalog and play my PC games. Or if you want to try some higher end emulators and streaming them to the device, that's also possible here. And last thing here before wrapping up is to test out whether or not we could use this game as a home console instead of just a portable handheld. And as you can see here, I'm using a micro HDMI to HDMI adapter and plugging into my monitor. Everything is working out great. 
Now the video output for the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus caps out at 720p resolution. So you're not going to be able to upscale beyond that, but even then playing PSP at a 3x resolution on a TV or a monitor is going to look really good. And the same thing can be said with upscaled Nintendo 64 and Dreamcast and so on. And for the life of me, I don't know why I didn't also test Bluetooth controllers at that same time, but I did test it later. And as you can see here, yes, you can connect Bluetooth controllers to it, multiple if you'd like. And so this can effectively work as a home console in the fact that you can plug it into HDMI, hook up some controllers and party on. Okay, now that all the impressions and testing are out of the way, let's actually discuss how I feel about the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus. And we'll start with the things I like about it. Number one is the build quality is very solid on this device. As a whole, the shell feels very sturdy and rugged, and I think it has an excellent screen, both in terms of resolution for the size as well as saturation. I also think that the buttons that they use across the board are decent. I like the soft clickiness of the D-pad and the shoulders and triggers, and while I have some minor quibbles about the face buttons, they're still very good. The other thing I like about it is that the software just works. For example, when I start up a streaming app, all of the buttons are recognized properly. In addition, HDMI just works as soon as you plug it in, and connecting via Bluetooth, all of it is very easy. Moreover, this device ships with the Google Play Store, which makes the setup a lot easier than other similar devices. In the end, all these things come together to make one excellent device, especially at that $150 price point. But of course, it's not perfect, so let's talk about some of the minor gripes that I have about it and the things I don't like. Number one is the placement of the start and select buttons up there on the top right. In the end, I don't think the placement is the end of the world, but it is a little bit inconvenient. And for a device that has so many thoughtful little additions, it just seems really out of place to make a bad decision like this. I'm also torn about the rubber conductive AB and XY buttons. Like I said in the beginning of the video, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with them. I just think it would have been a better fit to maintain the dome style switches like on the D-pad. A couple upgrades I wish I had seen between the Retroid Pocket 3 and the 3 Plus would have been the addition of analog triggers, especially given the fact that this device does pretty good when it comes to game streaming. And so when it comes to streaming certain games like racing games, analog triggers would have been much better. Same goes with GameCube emulation. There's many games that take advantage of those analog triggers and we can't use them here. And like I've said in my previous videos, I think that the analog sticks here are just a little bit too small for my liking. I think if they were a little bit wider and more raised, it would be more comfortable of an experience. Granted, it will make the device a little bit less pocketable, but I think it's a fair trade-off. I also would have liked to have seen a back button added to the right side of the shell. I appreciate that there's a home button, but a back button is much more useful when it comes to getting out of certain emulators. And finally, when it comes to playing some of those higher-end emulators, things like PlayStation 2 and Nintendo GameCube, the device does get more warm than the Retroid Pocket 3. It never got to the point where it was uncomfortably warm, but it will be definitely something that you notice. And so, given the minor complaints that I have about the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, what do I think about it in general and whether or not it's worth your money? And usually at this point in the video, I will say something along the lines of, well, it's really up to you. But I gotta say, at $150, this is the device to get. Heck, if you remember in my Retroid Pocket 3 video, I said that one was the one to get at $130. And when all is said and done, the difference between the two is worth way more than $20 to me. Now, if you already own a Retroid Pocket 3, then the decision is not so easy. At that point, I think you have probably three options. Number one is just to stick with the Retroid Pocket 3 and then maybe wait for the Retroid Pocket 4 or 4 Plus later on down the line. Additionally, you could shell out the $85 to get that upgraded PCB and then upgrade the device yourself. But I think the smart choice here, if you do want to upgrade to the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, would be to sell the old Retroid Pocket 3 and then use those proceeds to help fund the next one. Or even better, if you can afford it, then maybe gift the Retroid Pocket 3 to a loved one because they're going to love it. And then now you're missing a handheld and you have no other choice but to get the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus. Anyway, all kidding aside, this is an excellent handheld and I'm super impressed with what they've come up with at this price point. There are definitely better and more expensive handhelds out there to be found, but when it comes to the price to performance ratio, as well as just the sheer fun that you can get out of this $150, this thing can't be beat. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Are you picking up a Retroid Pocket 3 Plus or are you going to stick around for something else? As always, thank you for watching and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.